Welcome, everybody, um, to the Union League Club Virtual Authors Group Program, where today we're featuring authors Carrie Peck and Rick Law and their book, Don't Let Dementia Take Steal Everything. Um, also, Steve Schlegel will be doing the interview um, for this particular book. Um, it is a very important subject. I think it touches everybody's soul at one point or another. Um, you know, when somebody gets a diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease or some form of dementia, we need answers. So hopefully today we're going to get those answers. Um, if you want to purchase a book um, after this episode, please email myself or Lauren Mitchell, and we'll give you that email address at the end of the event, and we will make sure that you will get a book. Um, first of all, let me start off by introducing Steve Schlegel, who is a longstanding member of the Union League Club. He's been a member since 1976. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. And also Rick Law, who is also here with us, the author of the book. And Rick Law is a founder and lead attorney of Law Elder Law, and also an elder um, attorney expert. Thank you, Rick, for coming today or showing up from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, right, Rick? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here from the desert, so. <laughs> and we also have another longstanding member with us, Carrie Peck. Carrie is also the co-author of this book, and Carrie is a managing partner of a Chicago law firm, Peck and Ritchie. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Kathy. I look forward to a terrific event today. Yes. So it looks like we have about 80 attendees, so we're all going to learn a little something today. And so without further ado, take it away, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. I first want to welcome everybody uh, to what is something over the 1100th authors group uh, presentation of the Union League Club Public Affairs Committee. Uh, I want you to know that this book was published uh, initially last year before the uh, news of our current pandemic. Uh, this uh, presentation was scheduled to be live and uh, I felt at the time that I was most honored to uh, be a part of it for the simple reason that it is a book that is very helpful to large members of our community, large numbers of members of our community in what is the pre-existing pandemic and a great example of the outreach of the Union League Club and its commit commitment to community and country. Um, towards that end, uh, this book is not a heavy legal tome for lawyers in the slightest. Uh, Union League Club distinguished author, Scott Turo, familiar to all of you, wrote the introduction to this book. And uh, it's hard for me to uh, overdo what Scott said. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is one of the scourges of our time, he said, and one whose toll on the country will only deepen with the gang of, or with the aging of the baby boomers and the inevitability of increased lifespans. Prior to that, Scott revealed his own personal story in caring for his mother over the course of many years. It was a touching situation uh, and um, it is an example of the reaction that I have had to the announcement of this meeting from those who have read the E-Line announcement just as recently as yesterday. A number of people have written me back and said uh, personally that they were happy to have this uh, conversation and that it should have been done a long time ago and each of them revealed that they had struggled through caring for a loved one 
through each of the stages of dementia leading to death. Now, we're in, a, we're in the throes of a pandemic. And we've got two experts here who have written a great how-to book about, handle, about handling the effects of dementia uh, in all of its forms, including Alzheimer's. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rick Law with the following question. Just how big is this problem? And what can somebody do the second that they know that they suspect that someone has, that they're close to, or one of their coworkers, family members, whoever, uh, is going to be in need of some help? And uh, um, uh, just how uh, can they go about understanding what is happening to the patient? And um, how can they understand what's going to happen with their own family support group uh, down the line? So uh, Rick, you're the expert on it. I'd like to hear what you can tell us. Thank you very much, Steve. For, for me, this has been a, a, an incredible experience in, in working on this because the reality of the pandemic that you're talking about is that for those who will reach the age of 85, fully 45%, almost one in two, will be affected by some form of disabling dementia. And that is just a staggering number. You know, for those of us that were born in the, in the 50s, when we were born, our life expectancy was expected to last if we were males into our 60s and for women into their 70s. But these days, what has happened is that, is that people are living to be in their 80s and dementia is the scourge of our times. Now, as we look at this particular situation, for me, I first got involved with this starting 19 years ago. And 19 years ago, as a, as a tax attorney, and an investment attorney, this was not something that I knew anything about. But one day in my office, I got a call from my, uh, the church organist in our church. And this is what she had to say. She was in a state of panic and she said, Rick, Bob's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. What are we going to do? Am I gonna lose my home? Are we gonna lose everything? And back in those days, we never even really had the term elder law. And I really didn't know how to answer any of those questions. But it was that particular call where I said to, to the, the woman calling, I don't know, but I'll find out for you that really changed my life. And that's what eventually led me to, to, to know Carrie Peck, who's become a, a beloved friend and, and a, a co-counsel over the years. And several years ago, we were invited by the American Bar Association to write a book first for attorneys on dealing with Alzheimer's and the law and counseling clients with dementia. But what we really wanted to write was a book for the lay public because that's the group that has to actually know how to reach out to an attorney. So what Carrie and I did, you mentioned that this is not a boring legal tome. So thank you for that compliment because we use that exact term when we met with our editor from the American Bar Association. I bought all the other books that the ABA had on this subject and piled them up in front of her. And I said, these are all boring legal tomes. I said, if you want Carrie and I to write this book, what we are going to suggest is that you allow us to reach outside of the world of lawyers and invite in the voices of you know, forensic, forensic uh, psychiatric uh, help, uh, victims advocates for, el for elder abuse. We want, to, we want to have the voices of caregivers and others. And they were really excited about the idea. So for anyone who reads this book, Don't Let Dementia Steal Everything, they're getting a book that was written for all of the adults in this country dealing with their family members. And one of the most important things that Carrie and I put into that book, one of the key chapters is how to find a lawyer that actually knows this particular specialty area, this particular niche area. For me, this, these issues started 19 years ago with my friends Bob and Louise, but you mentioned how do we recognize when there's, when, when there's time to do something. And what one of the key things of doing this work and also being able to have the opportunity to work with the Alzheimer's Association and others 
we, Carrie and I, were able to get new insights into some of the things that we want that we need to share with the public. And so today, one of the most important things I can 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 share with you is that the public believes that the most telling sign of dementia is forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. But as but in, in this particular book on page four, Dr. William Tice, who's the chief medical officer of the Alzheimer's Association, tells us that that's actually not the red flag of Alzheimer's or dementia. The red flag of Alzheimer's or dementia is actually a change in character of the person's behavior from who they were before. If you have, if you, for example, if you have a man who always got the paper every morning because he was gonna do crosswords and that's what he's done for 60 years and suddenly he stops doing that, well, why? If you have someone who was always meticulous in the way they dressed, but suddenly now they're not behaving in that manner. The question is why? And so for the, for the lay public, one of the most important things that we can share today is that it's this change of character and behavior that is not obvious to, to even judges, but is a key component of what we need to see. This has just recently played out in my own family's life. My youngest aunt, who's still alive and in California, over the last number of months, and we only knew this because of a beloved neighbor who was her neighbor for 30 years, my aunt, who was always a very capable professional woman, participated with scammers who had put together a very elaborate scheme and put her into a situation where she was both in fear and also at the same time felt that there was a good guy as well. And she helped shovel out of her own assets up to $400,000. And really when we, had, when we had to go to court in California, the key thing that we would, would point to was the fact that this was so different than any behavior that my aunt would have had in the rest of her life. She never would have been sending boxes of $100 bills to people that she didn't even know. This is not characteristic. Yet, if you ask my aunt questions, her, her memory seems to be apparently fine, but her ability to process and understand what's going on is quite defective. So some of the key things that the person reading this book would find is that there's, they're going to find that a lot of things that they have believed to be true about the law relative to estate planning is not the law that is, that is true relative to dealing with the issues of long-term care. And if 50% of us are going to have some sort of dementia by the time we're, we're uh, 85, that means we need to be thinking about our own financial vulnerability. We need to be thinking about things that we need to be sharing as far as the type of care that we want to have in the event that we have those kinds of problems. And the subtitle of the book that we have here is, is really, it's, you know, it's don't let dementia steal everything. Avoid mistakes, save money, and take control. And one of the key differences between the work that I do and the work that Carrie does is we often are working in tandem. Carrie is a renowned litigator and he goes to probate court. Rick Law is a renowned wuss who doesn't want to go to court at all. And so I stay in my office all the time. And so like you, I mostly work on asset protection and estate planning and that sort of thing. But when it comes to the issues of taking control, the book addresses the whole idea of guardianship and conservatorship and dealing with scammers like, in, like I have dealt with with my own aunt. So we believe that this book is written for everyone in the country. It's a book that, that I've personally gotten a tremendous feedback from those I've recommended to in Texas and Florida and other places, and they've recommended it to other people as well. Well, thank you, Rick. Coincidentally, just yesterday morning, I had a conversation with a person in her 70s that went on and on about how confusing this um, computer age was and with cell phones and everything else and great worry about being scammed and being protective of herself. And uh, in this person's case, she's aware at the moment 
of these threats. Um, but um, simply reacting in fear and expressing her fear rather than getting any advice to go out there on how to prevent it and how to recognize problems with respect to other folks that she know in her age group. Um, that being said, um, back to the first uh, question for just a second. Yes. The E-line uh, said that every 65 seconds or so, someone is diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's in this country. That sounds to me to be as bigger, bigger than our current pandemic. And uh, we know the costs that we're paying now with our shut-ins and with the problems with uh, the uh, economy. Um, what can we do other than read a book like this and uh, watch carefully on the part of our loved ones, keep our eyes open, and know what we are supposed to do. Is there, is there a lot going on in the medical community that is offering some hope? If you had asked me that question 10 years ago and even five years ago, one of the things that when I was speaking to public audiences, I would always say somewhat as a cheerleader, well, there's a lot of things that they're working on and we have hope that something will come along and even as Scott Turow mentions in his introduction, that will help at least push back the date that we get to where we have severe cognitive impairment. Unfortunately, even last year, Biogen, one of the biggest drug companies, pharmaceutical companies in the world, gave up. And it was the last company to give up on what has been the primary thesis of dealing with the plaques and tangles, because the whole idea was if we could, if we could stop the production of the plaques and tangles in the brain, or even slow it down, then we could slow down dementia. But unfortunately, the number one thesis of which billions and billions and billions of dollars have been put into researching has not led to any positive outcome. And that's why it's extremely important as we look at the vulnerability, the vulnerability of all of our loved ones. And even going back to this most, you, you, you talked about talking to one of your clients or your family members yesterday. What I have seen with my aunt's situation most recently is the new age of scamming now that seniors have computers and all of their passwords are online, all of their Fidelity accounts online, their Schwab accounts online, all these things are online. And what happens is that the bad guys can easily get in and once they're in to a person's computer and their phones and we're dealing with a senior who many times is vulnerable long before they would be legally considered to be incapacitated they are become subject to, to scamming. So I think it's extremely important that the family members, as they're observing their loved ones, don't just shrug their shoulders and say, you know, mom's having a little bit of difficulty with memory or she's not having difficulty handling things and just shrug their shoulders and, and wait for another day. It's something to get closer to mom and have some deeper conversations to ferret out what the extent of, of, of issues may be. And really, Carrie might want to be able to, to jump in here on some of that as well. So let me jump in a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, to our, our uh, attendees today, you have the opportunity through your chat feature to pose questions uh, that as time allows, we'll be happy to answer. So uh, if you'd like to do that, please let us know. Um, I think at, at the end of the day, the, the, you know, the biggest problem that uh, we face in conjunction with this illness is that it is a tremendously horrid progressive illness. And I think everybody understands that uh, when someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, it's really a question at what point, what stage has that disease uh, progressed to? Is it stage one? Is it early onset? Is it moderate? Is it uh, advanced dementia? Because as this disease progresses, I think most people are unaware 
that not only does it have mental uh, manifestation and impact on someone's cognitive abilities, certainly we know for sure, as Rick suggested, first thing we typically respond to is mom or dad's forgetfulness. Mom or dad forgot where the car keys are. And sometimes mom or dad got in the car and they got lost. Or sometimes they uh, went to the bank and they didn't know why they were there or couldn't remember their passwords. But as this disease, this insidious illness uh, progresses, what happens is it becomes physically manifest manifested as well. So ultimately at the end of the day, when individuals, if they live long enough uh, to go into basically stage four of Alzheimer's disease, regrettably what happens is they forget how to swallow, they forget how to eat, and food gets into their lungs and they die often from aspiration pneumonia. So this disease which starts up here, okay, ends up throughout your entire body. And I think that, that um, that's significant in the context of how people understand Alzheimer's disease. So what I'd like to do is, um, is turn our attention to a number of, of uh, issues that relate to, as Rick suggested, uh, I'm a courtroom guy. I, I litigate these cases. And uh, what we see is that frequently cognitive impairment, and we've talked about senior scams, but cognitive impairment leads to financial exploitation. And that exploitation comes in a variety of forms. And let me tell you a story about a case that, that uh, we had in my law firm. Uh, we received a call from uh, adult children that uh, dad had lost his long-term wife and that uh, dad had gone to church, uh, what typically we consider a very, very safe place. Typically we all think churches and Senior centers and synagogues are, are safe locations. Well, shortly after dad lost his, uh, his life partner, his, his wife for many, many decades, he went to church about three weeks after the passing and he sat down in his normal uh, spot in the church in the pew and sitting next to him was, lo and behold, a young, attractive woman. And that young, attractive woman, what I like to say, it was love at first sight from her because it was love at first sight of his wallet. So at the end of the day, what did this lady do? In a, in a very quick fashion, the first week of this quote unquote newfound relationship, she took this gentleman who was a retired professional. We're not talking about somebody who, who didn't uh, have substantial education took this retired professional, her newfound love, uh, to his accountant and to his stockbroker during the first week that they knew each other. Now, to the credit of the stockbroker and the accountant, both of them said, who are you? Get out of my office. And that worked pretty well. But what they couldn't control was that dad, whose wife had been very ill for many years, suffering cancer, long-term and bout with cancer. Dad was lonely. And this young lady saw loneliness and saw a what she perceived to be a fat wallet as an opportunity, and she promptly moved in to the marital home. Again, during the first week of this newfound relationship. So of course, when the family became aware that uh, dad was now living in the, the marital home, the home where the adult children had literally been raised, they call us and go, what in the world are we gonna do? And the reality is the thing that we do uh, in circumstances like this on a very regular basis is we promptly had dad evaluated by a psychiatrist. And we sent the psychiatrist into the home and dad met with the doctor, and the doctor concluded that dad's 
cognitive abilities were severely impacted and that in fact, dad could not make decisions on his own any longer. So here in Illinois, when that circumstance arises, we file what I call a lifetime probate case, which is a guardianship. And a guardianship case is a determination as to whether Dad or Carrie or Rick or Steve need a third party decision maker. Who should be put in charge of Dad's finances? Who should be put in charge of Dad's health care decision making? Can Dad make those decisions on his own? Well, a board certified psychiatrist said he couldn't. And we promptly filed what's called a temporary guardianship on an emergency basis to go in and freeze dad's assets and to get someone to take action to protect dad's health so that dad lives out his normal long life if possible and he has the assets available to pay for his health care. These are critical issues because this loving, newfound, young, attractive gal was interested in nothing but a quick deed to the house, a potential new will, a potential new trust, potential large withdrawals from dad's brokerage account, and the like. These cases require prompt, prompt action on an emergency basis based upon the medical evidence that we can obtain. So we filed for guardianship, we froze dad's assets, and we protected dad from himself. That's a very, very significant problem in the context of individuals stricken with Alzheimer's disease or some form of dementia. Don't forget, dementia comes in a lot of forms. It comes in vascular dementia, which may be the result of strokes. It comes in, in, it is an insidious disease. I said that before, I'm saying it on purpose again. Most people I think are most familiar with Alzheimer's disease because there's a lot of press. The Alzheimer's Association does a great job educating people, but Alzheimer's disease, dementia, not necessarily interchangeable, but dementia comes in a lot of different formats. Let's take a look at another scenario in which cognitive impairment uh, impacts on individuals' lives. And you know, maybe, uh, maybe we ought to take some questions from the audience before I go to the next uh, scenario. Lauren, do you have some questions or do we, uh, how do we handle that one? Carrie, we do have some questions. Um, so one, one of the um, listeners asked, um, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Okay. Well, uh, as I mentioned, just I guess coincidentally, um, Alzheimer's disease is a specific diagnosis of a particular type of cognitive impairment. As Rick indicated, uh, the, all of the best medical evidence today tells us that the brain, the, your brain becomes uh, what's called uh, clogged up with amyloid plaque. And that amyloid plaque is uh, viewed generally post-death through autopsies, and it comes out in what's called plaques and tangles, literally, you know, kind of curly cues in your brain that detrimentally affect your ability to provide cognitive thinking in a positive way. So that's Alzheimer's disease. Uh, dementia is uh, certainly a subset of Alzheimer's disease, but typically uh, other types of dementia include, as I mentioned earlier, vascular dementia. When people have strokes on a repeated basis or even one stroke, it could lead to a form of dementia. Often stroke patients will lose the ability to talk, will lose the ability perhaps to use their left side or their right side they have uh, forms of dementia or a form of dementia that impacts on their ability to cognitively function. So there, there is some uh, overlap there, but there's also uh, significant different types of dementia as contrasted to Alzheimer's disease. Carrie, we have another question. 
Okay. If I believe my brother persuaded my mother to cut us out of the estate plan, what do I do? Well, that's that that's you know that's kind of the next area we need to talk about, which is um, individuals that are cognitively impaired, depending on how far the disease has progressed. Let's assume someone has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and they're now past stage one. They're into you know two or three. They have moderate Alzheimer's disease. They probably don't have the mental capacity, what we lawyers call testamentary capacity, to execute a new estate plan. And typically what we see in family disputes is one child has persuaded mom that he or she is the best and that that child should get all of their assets of the parent because they're going to take care of them they have taken care of them. And what they do is they poison the mind of their parent against other children and say, Johnny really doesn't care about you. He only wants your money. So at the end of the day, uh, an individual that's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease very early on, and I wrote an article uh, that appeared in the Alzheimer's Association magazine, if someone is diagnosed early on in the curve of the disease, they likely have the capacity to do estate planning. Often in the estate planning arena, in, in my law firm, and, and, and I know in Rick's law firm, when the capacity, the mental capacity of an individual to do an estate plan is in question, we ask them to be evaluated by a physician, often their own physician, to determine if they have the capacity to do an estate plan. So if mom dies and she's written an estate plan at the behest and the persuasion of one child to cut the others out, we file a will contest case post-death of mom. We allege that mom was unduly influenced by that child. We allege that mom lacked the mental testamentary capacity to do an estate plan. And we seek to overturn that estate plan. We will subpoena medical records. We will subpoena the testimony of witnesses to determine the viability of mom's capability at the time the documents are signed. I hearken back to the days of uh, the old Polaroid camera. Remember when you took a picture of the, uh, uh, using the Polaroid camera and everybody held up the paper, held up the, uh, the picture that popped out of the camera and they, they waved it around and they waited for it to, uh, to come to life so they could look in the picture. I use that analogy because when I take a Polaroid picture, hypothetically, of mom's brain on the day she signed the documents, I wanna know definitively, did she have the mental capacity to sign? And that mental capacity means she needs to know that she signed a will. She needs to know what her assets are. Legal terminology, she needs to know the nature and extent of her assets. She needs to know her family. She needs to know who's in her family. She needs to know the legal term is the natural objects of her bounty, her family. And finally, the toughest is mom has to have the ability to form a plan in her mind. And that's where that Polaroid picture comes in. Has mom been to the doctor lately? Did the doctor note that she was mentally and cognitively impaired? Did the doctor prescribe one of the leading medications for Alzheimer's disease? Dementia diseases, excuse me, Alzheimer's disease, typically uh, people receive Aricept or they receive Exelon or they receive Namenda. Is mom receiving that in conjunction with her ability to make decisions. Other questions? We have a question for Rick. Um, no questions right now for Rick. Um, well, I have, I have a question to uh, jump in with here. Um, it's my observation that this book covers such things as uh, I went through with my own mother that are nuts and bolts uh, problems, even though she didn't have dementia, she needed in-home health care. 
and uh, she was a creature of the depression and when I turned to her and showed her the first bill for the first <laughs> week, uh, she just about <laughs> jumped out of bed and told me that she, it wasn't worth it, that she could take care of herself. Clearly she couldn't. Uh, but um, there is information in this book about who takes care under what type of basis and uh, Carrie's example about the uh, one sibling taking advantage of another and talking against the other person to achieve a greater share of the family uh, estate is very common. And it, it is, it's common in my life in the terms of whether or not the siblings are able to provide the care in the early stages of disability and whether or not uh, one wants some credit for it as against the other who decides that uh, they or he or she are gonna stay out of this difficult problem of caring for either mom or dad. Um, is this book written exclusively to uh, shall we say, solve the problems after they take place, or is it more like, in, like a dispute avoidance advice as well as a caretaking advice book? Well, our, our goal was to prov provide a guide to lay families dealing with loved ones with dementia, which includes Alzheimer's, so that they could avoid problems, so they could avoid these kinds of problems. There's, you know, caregiving, Family intrafamilial caregiving for seniors is the is the is the majority case. However, uh, it's really important to get an attorney who knows this particular area involved. We have one whole chapter in this particular book on in-home caregiving and the the extremely important recommendation that there actually be a contract a contract when any family member is. Uh, involved in providing care so that it lays out what the compensation is going to be, if any, because this will surprise the listeners, but uh, there are laws in almost every state that when a family member provides care to another family member, there is a presumption that that is for uh, love and affection. So you cannot go back three or four years later and file a claim for having taken care of mom in your home for four or five years and say, well, well really she owed me rent, really she owed me for, for time. This is the sort of thing that needs to be, be worked out up front. And we have one whole chapter on in-home caregiving. And we also have a, a chapter on dealing with nursing home contracts and some of the little tips and tricks of those particular things. So this book uh, is very inexpensive. You know, I know on Amazon, it's like $16.95. And all that money goes to the American Bar Association. And, the, and they're definitely not in the business of marketing. But this book is just outstanding. And it will provide families with, again, we want them to avoid mistakes. We want them to save money and save conflict within their families. Steve, the, the other benefit to this book is that you can pick up this book and, and look in the table of contents. And uh, this is really a, a, a how-to book. It's a checklist book. You can go to the table of contents and find your particular problem and then flip to the, through the book and find a checklist in terms of what, how to solve your problem. So uh, there are a lot of people that are not gonna read this book from cover to cover because they don't uh, yet have the problems that are in the book. But regrettably, they likely will. And, and the benefit, as I indicated, is, and, and Rick has said, this is written for the, the, uh, the non-lawyer. And, you know, you can take this book and look at the to-do list and go down the list one, two, three, four, and, uh, and you've got a leg up over everybody else who faces the same problem but didn't have the foresight to turn to this book as a resource. In the words of Mr. Turo in the foreword, this book is a practical quick start guide so that you can be a beacon to a family member, a friend, um, 
clicked out of this thing. We can still I, hear you. I'm sorry here, if you could hear me. We can hear I'd you. Like, I'd like to start over. It's a practical quick start guide so that you can be a beacon to a family member, a friend, a loved one, or even a coworker who has been affected by the darkness of dementia. We talk about losses in life. We talk about the quality of life in terms of our physical strength, our mental capacity, and our emotional well-being, uh, the diseases of dementia, obviously, like other diseases, affect each of these uh, qualities of life. They're going to affect all of us who uh, get far enough along in terms of number of years on this planet to one degree or another. And uh, all I can do is say thank you to both of you fellas for giving us all a chance to solve our problems before they pop up and to know what to do when they do pop up. Um, do we have any other questions out there, Lauren? We do. Um, one is uh, the attorney's opinion on the risks and benefits of long-term care insurance. Very good. Well, that's my area more than anybody else's. So, so uh, first, first of all, long-term care insurance you know, could be its own 45-minute uh, topic, but long-term care insurance is really one of the most problematic areas of this particular uh, uh, disease because most of the time for, for those who actually decide that the that long-term care insurance is needed, it's usually, they're usually too old and they have pre-existing conditions and it's difficult to get it. These days, one of the things that we do recommend is that uh, those who are listening, there are two different directions to go and you would talk to your trusted advisor and or trusted insurance person and, and you'd be looking at uh, the traditional long-term care insurance, like uh, which is what we call use it or lose it long-term care insurance. And with that type of long-term care insurance, you're paying for a bucket of money to pay for, a, 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 to pay for care at home, at assisted living or at a nursing home. That's traditional insurance. And, one, and so it's, it's, uh, it, it's substantially expensive when you get to be older. But one of the alternatives that the insurance companies have come up with over the last decade to try to solve that uh, market rejection of the use it or lose it concept is tr building long-term care insurance on top of either a life insurance policy. So basically you're either going to collect money while you're using it for long-term care or you're going to collect money because you never need the long-term care but you have a higher death benefit. And uh, the alternative that uh, in this world of very low interest rates doesn't seem to have as much bang for the buck is building a long-term care rider into and onto an annuity type of a, a, a policy where you'd be a, a single, single purchase, a single um, premium will be paid and it would have an annuity type aspect. And then after a period of time, it would have a long-term care aspect. It's something that in my area of the practice, we have to look at the contracts, we have to do some analytics, and have to see if it makes sense from a standpoint of a return on investment. It's not something that you can just give a blanket statement. Don't pay any attention to it because in this work, and to show you how much I personally believe in long-term care insurance and how frightened I am of this issue, I actually have both types of long-term care insurance. Starting with, I was, I mean, I'm 69 years old now. I'll be 70 this summer. When I was 55, I bought a Genworth, uh, uh, use it or lose it, long-term care policy for myself and my wife, and I still have it, even though they have raised the premium. But in addition, because I'm concerned that they're gonna continue to raise the premium, several years ago, I rolled over one of my life insurance policies from one insurance company to another so that I could have cash value life insurance with a rider that would allow my wife to be able to use some of the death benefit and or cash value insurance for chronic care, chronic care, is meaning long-term care. So this is something that I do believe in, but insurance contracts are contracts and they sh should be reviewed by those who understand those contracts. Okay, we have another one. 
What if the parent in question refuses to sit for a competency exam or is being coerced not to sit for such an exam? Oh, I think that's probably in my family. Uh, the, the, this often happens. And uh, typically what uh, I would suggest is if there is substantial evidence that the parent is cognitively impaired and it potentially being taken advantage of or coerced not to sit for the exam, uh, it's, quite, it's quite clear from the question that the reason someone doesn't want mom or dad to sit for the exam is they're afraid of the outcome. And uh, typically that would tell me that that individual who's persuading mom or dad not to cooperate has some interest, more often than not, in the money. Many, many, many of these cases is, uh, it, it, you know, the mantra is follow the money. And what is that uh, child standing in the way of? It typically uh, screams out more often than not, they've got their fingers in mom's pockets or dad's pockets. And if the circumstances warrant, we would file a guardianship case uh, in the circuit court and we would ask the court to compel and order a uh, examination of mom to determine uh, or dad his or her capability. Great, we have another one and it actually refers to um, the old book as well. The question is, Carrie wrote a similar book several years ago with a different title. I have that book and like it a lot. How is this book different? Well, th the answer is that, that uh, when the American Bar Association came to, uh, to myself and to Rick, they originally asked that we would write a book for lawyers. And, um, you know, the American Bar Association is the National Bar Association for Lawyers. It's a trade association. And they asked us to write this book, Alzheimer's and the Law. So this book is written for attorneys. Uh, the book we're talking about today, this book, is written for non-attorneys. This book is written for family members. This book is written for uh, folks that... Uh, have these issues, that have a loved one that is maybe afflicted with dementia or Alzheimer's disease and uh, is looking for a resource that they can open up uh, and they can say, you know what, I've got a good idea here and this book has told me that I should look for a lawyer that has some credentials in this world, uh, the, meaning the elder law world, and has some credentials uh, perhaps with the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and, and both Rick and I do. And this book is not, uh, you know, there's no Latin in this book, so to speak. Latin, as you may know, is, you know, lawyer talk. So this book is written for uh, the, you know, the non-lawyers uh, of, uh, of the country. And uh, I think that there is a significant uh, difference uh, in the two books. And, and one of the things that I would add to it is the, the, the first book is written for lawyers and as all textbooks, it's, it's, it's rather pricey. It's almost $130 a copy, whereas the uh, book we wrote for lay people, thank goodness, uh, it was, was intended to be priced below $20 and it is below $20. I think right now on Amazon, it's $16.95 and you'll find it quite accessible. And, I, and the, the American Bar Association, we work quite closely with the American Bar in pricing this book. On the American Bar website, I think it's $24.95. But um, the reality is we wanted to make this book very affordable for uh, the entire public uh, should they have an opportunity to require this uh, type of information. We have another question. Um, this one is, how do you help families get a parent to stop driving? Physicians are generally reluctant to deal with this. Uh, Rick, would, do you want me to do it or do you want to do it? Well, I'll start and you can finish. So, you, you, know, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, it, it often does involve the guardianship, but there are times, depending upon uh, family members working with their own family members, where you potentially can just disable the car. You can, you can make it so it's not obvious why the car is not working. So dad or whoever, even if they have keys, can't 
flee during the night. I've had the same issue with my aunt in California, by the way. And so we basically had the car uh, disabled. Uh, I mean, it looks fine, but it would, re would require somebody to come out and actually put the spark plugs back together the right way. So that, that's one part of it. But the other thing is much bigger than, one, than this car issue because the person who asked the question is actually bringing up a huge issue, which is physicians in this day and age are unwilling to take the risk of saying that a person has dementia. And if we wanna look at the world of, of medicine, almost all of our doctors now work for the hospitals. And so they follow whatever the hospital rules are. And the hospitals do not want their doctors having to go into court. So Carrie can pick this up more, but we are, when we are working with a client family that has this kind of pressure and stress, we, as, and he mentioned it earlier, we are often bringing a geriatric psychiatrist or some other person into the situation to give us further advice. Why don't you take it from there, Carrie? Well, I, I think it's a terrific point. Um, attending physicians, your, your, your typical, so to speak, internist, the family physician, often doesn't want to offend the, the patient. Uh, you know, mom gets up in age, she's been seeing the same doctor for 20 years, uh, and the doctor wants to maintain a good relationship, and Rick's pointed out the hospital scenario, so that that doctor, more often than not, uh, doesn't want to use, we have a doctor we've done programs with, who says, the doctors don't want to use the A word, and that's Alzheimer's disease. So, um, Typically, we will then bring in a, uh, you know, a, a board certified physician in geriatrics or uh, in, in psychiatry in that arena that can assess somebody and doesn't have the family relationship and is willing to do uh, the diagnosis and willing to do, you know, the mini mental status exam and whatever other testing they may want to provide or perform to reach a diagnosis. Uh, I will also, let's go back to the, the, where we started on the car issue. I think that, that taking away the car keys may be the hardest decision that families face in this arena. Uh, I can tell you that with my grandfather, um, and this is really the truth, we told my grandfather that his car was stolen. Uh, we took it off the, off the driveway where he parked it and it disappeared. Now, of course, he said, well, you know, I can go buy a new one. And so we had to deal with that issue. But that was the only way that uh, he was going to stop driving because his car wasn't there for him to get in and drive away. And there is no good answer to this very, very difficult problem because seniors know when they lose their car, it's the end. They've lost their independence. And they may be cognitively impaired, but they clearly understand the inability to get in the car and go to the grocery store or drive wherever they choose, even if they get lost, is the end of their independence. And so it is a, uh, there's no textbook, there's no playbook. You need to, to kind of work it out. Hopefully you can get a doctor that helps uh, and some doctors are willing to, and some families, write the Secretary of State's office and say, you know, dear Mr. Jesse White, uh, this person can't drive anymore. Call them in for, for a exam. Bring them in to do the written exam. Bring them in to do the driving test. And when mom or dad gets that notice, they typically don't want to rush off to have a, a driving exam uh, done because they know what the outcome is going to be. Other questions? We have another one. How do we think this pandemic will affect families' willingness to have their loved ones live in a senior living community? Well, we're dealing in, in, in our office, we are not only attorneys, we are uh, guardians. My daughter is the Kane County Public Guardian, Kane County, uh, Illinois, and I'm the Kendall County Guardian. And because I'm a senior who's right now hiding out in Phoenix, Arizona, and wondering when I'm gonna be able to actually go back into, into circulating, you know, for somebody like, like me who is a high risk and I have asthma, you know, we, we all are concerned about these, these areas. 
you know, when you read the news, it certainly is a problem. It certainly is a problem not only to have seniors uh, who are in, in, in care homes and nursing homes have many people who have passed away. At the same time, there's many situations where seniors are vulnerable to having younger family members. You know, for me, if I was a person right now with, with Alzheimer's, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I've left to go to Arizona is I can't even be around my, my grandchildren or my children. I'm grateful that they have a, they are much hardier and this particular disease is not uh, striking them. But, but it is something that when you're dealing with seniors now, we're going to find that we're going to have to take extraordinary care. And I can't say anything more than that because as we know, this, the coronavirus and future therapeutics, as well as vaccines, uh, the therapeutics are hopefully going to be quicker sometime, uh, maybe late in the year, but the vaccines certainly are not going to be until next year. So, this, so if your loved one is in a safe situation in their current home, or, with, or with, a, with a family member, I would think that for the short term, the right answer is to keep them in that safe situation where you can keep them safe. So that's my quick answer. Other questions? I was struck um, by the last interchange with Carrie's comment about the driver's licenses and uh, a uh, person's loss of independence. And I thought of it as a good example of not only why this book is a great self-help guide, but a great example of the strength of that fear of losing independence that we're all going through at the present time. I am not independent enough so that I can drive to the office uh, none of us that are looking in are. And um, all of a sudden, we're saying, well, uh, wait a minute, what am I going to do the next hour of my life? I'm going to get some work done. Uh, am I okay here? And uh, it, this is just magnified beyond, uh, beyond description when you talk about the at-risk group of um, the coronavirus uh, being all the people that are more at risk to dementia and Alzheimer's and increasing the fears all around. Understanding that problem and getting understanding from this book uh, can give us all some great help in overcoming those fears and perhaps eliminating those fears upon the person who just won't give up the car keys. So if there are no further questions, I'm gonna thank both Rick and Carrie, especially for writing the book and uh, specifically for coming uh, out in this author's group presentation. Uh, I can't speak on behalf of the club except as a member, but I'm proud to be a member. I am honored to have been a part of this presentation. I hope you all stay in, stay healthy, stay well, and go out and buy the book. It's not gonna hurt anything. Steve, can I make a final comment here? You sure can. I, I also would like to thank the Union League Club. I'd like to thank our, our executive director, Mark Tunney. I'd like to thank all the people that worked hard to make this event of, take place. Uh, Certainly, Kathy Hurley, Jared, Jared Wick, uh, Deborah Lee, our, our technical uh, staff, Josh Stell and Brian Williams. Uh, thank you all very much for all your cooperation and, uh, and making certain that uh, we had the opportunity to uh, address the community today on this important subject. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, again, if you want to purchase the book, um, Rick, I think you mentioned you can purchase it on Amazon. I just saw it on Amazon today. And um, if you would like to purchase it through the ABA, you can also email Lauren or myself. I can be reached at khurley at ulcc.org. 
And also there was one final question that I think we should really address because it, it sounded like it could really be important. Um, it was from one of our attendees and it was, here's the question. I believe um, in Illinois, a doctor can communicate um, with the secretary of state. Okay, so we did answer that one. Um, in the case of um, epileptic seizures, can it be done with a diagnosis of dementia and how difficult can it get to do um, to have a physician answer that? But I think, I think we pretty much covered all of that. Um, Lauren, I don't see any of that. Oh, okay, so you're, okay. So you're going through everything. Looks great. Thank you everybody for attending. Have a great day all. Be safe, be healthy.